Sir Luciani, for this very kind uh, introduction. It's really an honor uh, for me to be included in this um, uh, series of distinguished speakers at the SOAS China Institute. And also thank you to everyone for tuning in. Uh, I'm really looking forward to your questions and comments. So um, let me just uh, share my screen, my slides. And um, so my talk today actually will bring together two um, new book projects that try to historicize and um, theorize audiovisual media in, in socialist China. Uh, actually, the, the, the sound project has a longer timeline. Uh, Cinematic Gorillas um, is a book that I have just finished and hopefully will be coming out next year. Uh, it has a, um, the current subtitle is Maoist Propaganda as Revolutionary Spirit Mediumship, but I may be changing that to um, Propaganda um, Projectionist and Audience in, in Socialist China. And it considers um, exhibition and reception um, in from the 1950s to the 1980s. Uh, another new emerging project I would really like your feedback on is called Revolutionary Echoes, uh, Radio, Loudspeaker and Noise in Modern China. And I'm thinking about um, dating it for a century from 1920s to the 2020s, the, the ending date I haven't decided on yet. And both of these are um, also related to my first two books in the sense that they are, uh, they examine the mediation of experiences and memories in 20th and 21st century China. So um, together, Cinematic Guerrillas and Revolutionary Echoes uh, argue that uh, the Chinese revolution was a media revolution. So from the 1950s to the 1970s, the uh, Communist Party actually filled up this um, giant uh, film exhibition and wired broadcasting network with more than 100,000 film projection units and 100 million loudspeakers. So by media revolution, I mean not just a revolution in media content, but also a revolution of media infrastructure and a revolution through media impact or effect. Um, so uh, media content represented rep revolution, uh, media infrastructure amplified revolution, uh, whereas media mobilization made the revolution in some mass media helped to conjure into being the revolutionary masses, uh, the masses. And that leads to my second thesis, which is that the Chinese revolution was also a hot and noisy revolution from slogan shouting to collective singing to mass parades uh, with gongs and drums, making noise in big crowds was an integral part of making revolution as the phrase now growing, noising revolution, stirring up revolution also suggests. Um, but in terms of audiovisual memories, I noticed when I was interviewing Chinese villagers about their uh, memories of um, uh, radio and cinema, uh, they often talked about now, uh, you know, or hot noise instead of film titles or radio programs. They said uh, going to film was watching hot noise and listening to broadcasts is listening to hot noise, which suggests that the content actually mattered less than the hustle and the bustle of the event. Taking their earthy language quite seriously, I wondered first about radio and cinema as communicators of propaganda messages, and secondly, about noise as unwanted sound and disrupt, uh, disruption of signals. So contrary to um, theorist uh, Jacques Attali, who talked about noise as violence associated in all cultures with a weapon, blasphemy, and plague, uh, Nao, of course, for Chinese popular um, religion, theater, and markets described what um, anthropologist at Adam Chow calls sociothermic affect, a lively, busy, and boisterous ambience sought after at New Year celebrations, temple fairs, weddings, and birthdays. So it's not just sound, but also color and clutter, smoke and steam. It's really very much um, uh, generated through this assembly of warm bodies, a multi-sensory and polyphonous uh, celebration of life. Now, I know Rio now is this uh, common place that belongs to a Chinese dictionary of untranslatables. And uh, hot noise is absolutely incommensurate as a translation, but I think there's something can be gained from this jarring translation because it defamiliarizes the original and also compels us to interrogate the sources, effects, and valences of heat and noise. 
So whereas Ruanao has always been part of the uh, Chinese everyday life, I would consider the socialist hot noise to have achieved unprecedented scale and intensity with the technological amplification of audiovisual media. Uh, because loudspeakers in cinema had summoned mass assemblies, parades, uh, calisthenics, and struggle sessions. So whereas the heat in Ruanao refers to the bodily heat of a uh, gathered crowd, um, the heat in socialist hot noise derives from a synergy between body and electricity that also soldered scattered populations into the revolutionary masses. So um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about loudspeakers in the first part and then about open air cinema in the second part of the talk and then close with a coda on the current sort of updates on the uses of loudspeaker and mobile cinema in the contemporary in the last couple of years actually. So um, before 1949, China had only about a million radio sets, radio receivers. Most of these are in urban households. Um, and thinking about radio in the Republican period, we can take a look at this 1936 cartoon, uh, which uh, kind of shows um, um, uh, a politician in the center, you know, saying that there's a national emergency, and then he's calling out um, quite ineffectively because the rest of the radio listeners around him are all listening to popular music. So instead of listening to the politicians siren-like warnings of national crisis, they are listening to siren songs that distracted them from the looming danger. In 1949, however, um, Mao, of course, announced the uh, founding of the PRC over radio and inaugurated a uh, revolutionary Beijing time. And very quickly, the CCP has uh, sort of monopolized the airwaves in the next couple of years. And, you know, something like 60 radio stations in Shanghai are reduced to just uh, the central broadcasting station and then the, the Shanghai People's uh, Radio Station. And, um, and while at, in the meantime, also the government tried to um, stop radio owners from listening to the noise of enemy stations, such as noise of the uh, Voice of America by uh, mobilizing technicians to actually physically dismantle shortwave on all radio sets in order to quote, cut off the enemy's tongue so that it cannot spread any rumors. And then following Lenin's praise of radio as a newspaper without paper and without distances, uh, the CCP used it to govern this vast country with poor transportation and a mostly illiterate population. So through collective listening, radio transformed from domestic objects into public loudspeakers, which are also um, deployed at mass rallies, uh, so-called uh, broadcast rally, Guangbo Dahui, to suppress counter-revolutionaries and to mobilize for the Korean War in 1951. But at that point, available loudspeakers were not loud enough to reach China's vast countryside. So um, a vast uh, radio reception network was established with radio operators who carried radio sets to villages uh, for collective listening wired to, to loudspeakers. Of course, they also transcribed and mimeographed the radio broadcast for distribution uh, through school pupils. So they would take these mimeographs into their villages and these would be then transcribed onto the blackboard bulletins as well as read out loud via something called rooftop broadcasting, which is Wuding Guangbo. So the criers would be uh, using these homemade speaking trumpets in order to relay messages from on top of roofs. In this sense, humans played a very big mediating role in the Maoist media network, and corporeal voices became literally the mouthpieces or the throat and tongue, the hoshe of the party. Now, I think there is actually a really interesting latent Chinese media theory of the mouthpiece, hoshe, to be excavated um, all the way from the classics of poetry compiled by Confucius calling the king's ministers his throat and tongue to the late Qing thinker Liang Qichao, who talked about newspapers um, as the eyes, ear, throat, and tongue or mu hoshe of a national body. And um, if Chinese villagers, uh, they, they were likening radio broadcasting to the folkloric thousand mile eye and wind accompanying ears, Chen Li Yan, Shun Feng Er, they serve the Jade Emperor. And then they, you know, I think that in a way they would intuitively understand also foundational uh, media theorist, Marshall McLuhan's definition of media as the extensions of man. 
But um, okay, sorry. But available loudspeakers were actually not loud, not loud enough to reach China's vast countryside. So the government established a radio. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Um, um, but when mass media was was underdeveloped, um, um, Mao also saw the potential of masses as media. So he was even writing in uh, 1927 of the corporeal mediation of prop viral propaganda, uh, saying that slogans have grown uh, wings and found their way to countless villages, to the young, the middle aged, and the old, to the children and the women. They have penetrated their minds and flowed to their mouths. So instead of media as the extension of man, Maoist media networks turned humans into flexible extensions of media. And this is an idea that is actually illustrated in many Maoist films. So for example, in the heroic little gorillas, uh, Ying Xiong Xiao Ba Lu, children here are holding hands in order to connect a broken telephone cable so that the commander of the People's Liberation Army can order fire at the enemy. Uh, in another film called uh, Letter with Feather. Children are standing sentinel next to so-called information tree, Xing Xi Shu, which indicates safety or danger. And this boy, when he saw a tree fall in the distance, he knocks over his tree and then shouts at his comrades in the valley uh, to beat their gongs and drums to alert the villagers of approaching danger. So without cameras, telephones, wireless radio, um, you know, or even loudspeakers and wheeled vehicles, this network of eyes, ears, voices, and legs constituted a surveillance, alarm, communication, and transportation network, which I also call guerrilla media network. Now, um, this guerrilla media network woven out of human agents not only substituted for machines, but also performed a kind of revolutionary spirit mediumship. And I illustrate this with the ending of um, this other film, uh, Everlasting Radio Signals, in which the hero is a guerrilla radio telegrapher who receives and transmits the party's messages and dies a martyr. But rather than hearing the messages that he taps out, we see the superimposition of his face, the clouds and radiating wireless ways, suggesting this intersection of technology and spirituality media and mediums. So the party's missionary turns into an angel and what he mediates is less ideological principle than the revolutionary spirit of self-sacrifice. So while human voices served as um, mouthpieces, human bodies also learned to respond to the call of loudspeakers through broadcast gymnastics, first borrowed from Japan's uh, um, sort of radio gymnastic, radio taisho, and because radio in Japanese and then, you know, said in Chinese sounds a little bit like la jiao, which means chili peppers. Uh, initially, uh, guangbo ti cao or broadcast uh, gymnastic was actually called la jiao cao or chili pepper gymnastics. And um, Amplify, uh, at that point, uh, factory loudspeakers were also introduced from the 1950s onwards. And they amplified not just the party state's voice, but also invited uh, labor models to speak and talented workers to sing almost in a kind of community karaoke. Uh, they also staged many labor competitions, which very much stressed out my grandmother, who was a silk worker in Shanghai. She would blame those loudspeakers for her later her high blood pressure and an impaired hearing. Now in the 1960s, the broadcasting network expanded greatly into the countryside. And uh, so the statistics, especially like there, there was a hike during the um, cultural revolution period. And village loudspeakers regulated daily rhythms, almost a bit like uh, European church bells, but they also industrialized the rural time and labor discipline. So in an ethnographic account uh, Chen about Chen village, the broadcaster's first announcement got the women out of bed 
uh, to feed the pigs and prepare breakfast before their husbands arose, she would give pep talks, praise diligence, and criticize laziness. And when other villagers saw her coming, they would joke, well, be better watch out because if you're a little lazy, you would be on the loudspeakers. So in this sense, loudspeakers serve not just propaganda, but also surveillance. And this is very much true in the COVID era, which we'll get to a little bit later. Um, but in terms of labor mobilization, as I also read about how bells and horns enforce labor discipline in the antebellum South, I also have to ask if socialist loudspeakers sounded liberation or slavery for Chinese villagers. Now in the Cultural Revolution, answering Mao's call to make revolution, Red Guards installed uh, high volume loudspeakers in public spaces nationwide, blasting revolutionary songs and slogans that also contribute to the Mao cult. Um, I just play this briefly, but local loudspeakers also led collective readings from the Little Red Book. Uh, such that one interviewee I spoke to associated with this practice with a minaret loudspeakers calling uh, Muslims to prayer, which she had witnessed as a tourist in Morocco. And she said that really reminded her of the Cultural Revolution. The acoustics of the loudspeakers was very echoey, as you can hear here. So it's not good for message translation, uh, transmission at all, but it's rather a, a kind of acoustics of power due to the omnipresence of these disembodied voices. And it's a bit like the soundscape of cathedrals and other sacred spaces of worship. Um, I actually also thought about how reverberant acoustics correlate with divine power while rewatching uh, Journey to the West TV drama uh, with, with my son. Oh. <laughs> so you see that the Buddha had a long echo to his voice, whereas the monkey had none, right? So he, the Buddha is much more powerful apart from his visual size. And then apart from this kind of almost as a sacred, quasi-sacred landscape, uh, soundscape, uh, loudspeakers also led to acoustic conflict that foreboded and fueled physical violence as rebel factions were fighting over broadcast stations. So that even when they were broadcasting very similar revolutionary messages, shouting matches between um, competing loudspeakers suggest that power in the Cultural Revolution was measured in decibels. And um, here I'm also inspired by comparative studies in the context of 1930s Germany and contemporary Nigeria, where loudspeakers escalated conflicts between ideological groups and religious sects. Now, for many re revolutionary targets, the loudspeaker did become a source of terror because one way that, say, Red Guards tortured intellectuals like Chaninko was to hang a loudspeaker at his window so that this reactionary academic authority can hear the angry indictment of the revolutionary masses. Uh, some Red Guards even called on their targets to appear before impromptu interrogations and put an alarm clock next to the microphone to magnify the time bomb like ticking. No wonder writer Shen Songwen uh, considered a great improvement of his living condition to move out of the earshot of a high volume loudspeaker. Now the same Red Guards who tortured with uh, loudspeakers likely participated as children in the noisy war against sparrows in the 1958 for pests campaign. Directed by loudspeakers, men, women, children, and the elderly of entire counties and cities clamored from dawn to dusk to keep sparrows from landing so that they can fall from fatigue. Lugo
So the voiceover says, if you visit this township now, you won't see flocks of sparrows anymore, nor sparrow nests and eggs. As long as we set up nets above and snares below, sparrows cannot escape even with wings. So this uh, documentary newsreel was actually made in Sichuan. The method itself originated in Sichuan. So, and this newsreel was actually uh, shown ahead of similar campaigns throughout the country. And after every battle, loudspeaker vans decked with uh, dead sparrows um, toward the street. So the final toll was something like 2.1 billion uh, dead sparrows, uh, which is about four times the Chinese population at that time. It presaged and contributed to the Great Famine. Now, besides the Great Sparrow Massacre, Red Guards are also likely inspired by sparrow war tactics, Ma Chie Zhan Shu, where the sparrows are not the victims, but the attackers. So sparrow warfare was um, a synonym for guerrilla tactics and was invented in the 1930s and celebrated in military pedagogical films like Tunnel uh, Warfare. Um, and this is a film that has also been watched by you know, two, 2 billion views from the 1960s to the 70s. And you'll see how guerrillas here are, are imitating sparrows by dispersing forces in the mountains and making noises in order to perplex, unsettle, and sow chaos so that the enemy cannot eat or sleep in peace. Okay, so whether um, Mihuadiran, so whether it's imitating sparrows or killing sparrows, sparrow warfare was a war of noise as both uh, disturbing sounds and false signals. Now this kind of noise terrorism might be rooted in Chinese popular religion, such as the annual exorcism of the Nian monsters with firecrackers on Chinese New Year. And in some ways, this kind of exorcist logic of censorship is also applied to so-called class enemies. And you know, from 1957 onwards, Mao had advanced this exorcist logic of censorship, saying that uh, that the ox demons and snake spirits, uh, come out to make some noise. And here he's referring to critics of the party, so that the people shocked to find these ugly things still existed would take action to wipe them out. More exposure than uh, disappearance, more sound than silence. Uh, censorship as exorcism, in a way, was reviving a pairing of incantation, zhou, uh, with interdiction, jin, in these Taoist exorcist healing rituals that used powerful words to eliminate demons that caused pestilences. Modern media technologies greatly amplified exorcist incantations, which were printed, calligraphed, chanted, broadcast, and projected. And the, uh, the last speaker, particularly uh, growing more than tenfold in the early years of the Cultural Revolution, contributed to the soundscape of pandemonium while serving as a key source of entertainment for much of the 1970s. The end of the Cultural Revolution was also sounded by omnipresent loudspeakers playing somber music to uh, mourn Mao's death. And yet afterwards, uh, high volume loudspeakers were dismantled to reduce noise pollution, which also suggests a cooling of revolutionary passions, only to see a revival in recent years, which are addressed a bit more in the coda. So now I want to go on to talk a little bit about cinema, which is the main mode of movie going, uh, the open air cinema in particular, um, which was the main mode of movie going in rural China from the 1950s to the 1980s. And here I define the hot noise of open air cinema as its extra filmic sensorium. So the sights, sounds, smells, tastes, and textures beyond the film. And um, I like to use one clip that's, um, you know, uh, from from John Chen's film to reconstruct this kind of multi-sensory experience. Uh, 
They're watching heroic sons and daughters in the countryside, and、uh, you see the embodied presence of the mobile projectionist and his machine here. And audiences are kind of singing along as well. And if you were there, you might be able to hear and smell the power generator and the cattle. Okay, so、um, the cinema initially sort of gathers a crowd like a ritual opera at a, a temple festival, whereas the sing along of revolutionary songs is reminiscent of Christian congregational singing. So, in so far as it occasioned these collective rituals, cinema was not just representational but also congregational.、Uh, and along these lines, my、um, also the the practice of seeing before, during, and after, well, more more before and during、uh, screenings was uh, uh, was very much advocated、um, by projectionist magazines as well. And、um, in terms of、um, uh, congregational gatherings, I would argue that Mao cinema was also a form of revolutionary spirit mediumship that can be summarized with the keywords magic, cult, liturgy, conversion, and exorcism.、Um, many Chinese villagers encountered film for the first time through these mobile projectionists who carried cinema into、um, areas without electricity. Uh, and in that sense, also cinema and mouse media networks in general was constituted not just by machines but also by by human bodies. And many early reports from the 1950s mentioned the bumpkin wonder of first-time audiences at the technological magic of cinema. So, for instance,、uh, audiences of a war film might return the next morning to look for leftover artillery. Or a village would cook up a feast for all the actors they saw in the film, etc. Many sort of anecdotes like that. And、uh, a Qinghai projectionist wrote、um, about the wonder of Tibetan nomads, saying, "How can a hanging white cloth envelop thousands of troops? How can a wooden box speak in so many different voices? How can that long, long-sounding power generator,、uh, Tibetans call it the mother of electricity, draw lightning from the sky?" All of this is truly mysterious and unfathomable for people who worship gods and spirits without knowledge of science and technology. So this is recorded in the Qinghai Film Gazetteer. You know, this kind of descriptions of so-called primitive encounters with modern technology are also curiously reminiscent of European colonial discourse. Michael Tosik notes the white man's fascination with the other. Fascination with white man's、uh, magic, such as cameras and gramophones, and argues that this actually reflects the West's own obsession with the mysterious underbelly of technology. Brent Larkin has used colonial sublime to describe British colonizers' efforts to showcase modern infrastructure,、uh, such as railroads, radio, and cinema, as evidence of the supremacy of European technological civilization. While the Chinese communists were clearly anti-colonial revolutionaries, they also harnessed cinema to enhance the emergent、um, uh, personality cult of Mao. And Mao's appearance in newsreels was reported as the greatest attraction for rural audiences, who would applaud, take off their caps, or ask the、uh, projectionist comrade to slow down and let Chairman Mao stay a bit longer. So there are all these reports, which I. Really, would take with a certain grain of salt, but、um, beyond the illusion of life presence, Mao's image did literally light up these dark village nights without electricity, and、uh, projectionists were also actively staging these、uh, these congregations of worship.、Uh, moreover, many screenings in the、um, um, Mao era did take place in former spaces of worship, such as courtyards of ancestral shrines, temples, and churches. So that cinema, in a way, was taking after their sacred aura. 
um, in the Cultural Revolution in particularly, the uh, villagers often welcomed newsreels of Mao's uh, Red Guard rally films with gong and drum processions led by a village chief who would then carry the film prints with red ribbons in the Mao portrait from its last projection site. So that contra water um polarization of um, exhibition value and cult value, the cinema became a cult object via its mass exhibition. And beyond this, uh, projectionists in themselves were a bit like ritual specialists who curated cinematic liturgies. Their ritual instruments included not just the noisy machines and film prints, but also bamboo clappers and lantern slideshows. And in particular, um, like um, this one is uh, animated slideshows by the Three Sisters movie team, where they put multiple lenses together uh, and were slide putting the slides to create animation special effects. Um, uh, the voices and gestures of uh, film projectionists um, translated these standardized films into local dialects and performance genres. And this kind of extra filmic noises by the projectionists not only helped audience comprehension of the films, but also enlivened the cinematic event with audience participation. Okay, now um, akin to missionaries, projectionists also try to convert their audiences to faith in communism. So in the 1950s, cinema was often dubbed uh, socialist distant horizon education, showcasing Soviet collective farms, killed by tractors to promote rural collectivization. Projectionists also reported many conversion testimonies, such as now that I have seen such and such a film or a slideshow, my eyes grew bright and I will work hard all my life to turn these mountains into a paradise. Uh, in a way, spiritual conversion was leading to energy conversion because audiences are urged to emulate the revolutionary spirit on screen, sometimes by forming uh, or shock work brigades that are named after uh, war heroes. So if martyrs can bleed and die for communism, what's a little sweat for socialism? That was one of the slogans. So projectionists not only carried power generators, they became power generators, which gathered the hot noise of the masses and urged them to emanate light and heat. Uh, sometimes grassroots cadres even hired movie teams not to show films, but rather to provide electric lighting and sound amplification and mass rallies, even for these all-nighter shifts for um, infrastructure construction projects. And in this sense, cinema became sheer electrification that inspired and conscripted the masses to make revolution day and night. Now, lastly, the spirit mediumship of Maoist cinema lies with its exorcism of class enemies. So whereas ritual opera stage at ghost festivals were banned in this period, uh, revolutionary cinema conjured up the hell of old society and were coordinated with struggle sessions. So after screenings, um, possessed by the ghosts of the pre-revolutionary past, um, audiences identifying with the film's uh, victims would speak bitterness and indict local landlords, who then also must be um, purged to ensure the purity of the revolutionary community. But public responses to films were not always genuine. So for example, this 1963 film um, called Nongnu or Serfs, Play this clip. Um, it depicted the harrowing life of a, a poor Tibetan boy who was uh, who would eventually be liberated by the communists. But in a crucial scene in the middle, um, he was very hungry, so he steals food from a temple, a temple and gets caught. But because the the film is such a perversion of uh, Tibetan history, according to uh, scholar Tsering Shakia. Um, audiences in Lhasa felt very little sympathy for him and renamed this film The Altar Thief. Nevertheless, audiences in Lhasa were required not only to watch this film, but also to cry. Otherwise, you risked being accused of harboring sympathy with the feudal landlords. So um, Shakia said his mother and her friends put tiger bomb under their eyes to make them water. So even if audiences did not feel moved, they had to act as if they were, and to join the socialist hot noise of leader worship, 
labor mobilization, and enemy denunciation. But some of the audience noise can also mock and subvert the films that are being screened. Um, as writer Achim describes open air screenings in Yunnan's mountains in the 1970s, you needed several men to take turns powering the um, generator uh, by pedaling. And sometimes the man pedaling got tired and the electricity would fluctuate, causing the sound from the loudspeakers to become slurred, distorting the well-known arias Meanwhile, on the screen, an uplifting scene of the heroic deeds might have started boldly, but suddenly lapsed into hesitation. Other times, the man on the pedals changed the tempo on purpose, uh, creatively improvising, and the old films would send the audience into fits of laughter. So as audiences became jaded with the repetition of formulaic films, extra filmic noise could become actually much more meaningful than the film proper. And open air audiences also practice a kind of in-place listening to the distant thunder that meant imminent rain or barking dogs that meant warning against thieves. So um, in conclusion, the hot noise of loudspeakers in open air cinema were integral parts of the Chinese revolution that was also a media revolution. Electrified sounds and sights helped to generate and magnify the um, uh, revolutionary masses through immersive soundscapes and mass congregations. So the Chinese, so, um, so Chinese socialism was an age of mass media as well as masses as media and the synergy of machines and bodies is also exemplified by human loudspeakers and mobile projectionists who are then like corporeal extensions of media infrastructure that turned propaganda into spirit mediumship. Now, a coda for the sort of more contemporary period, because in the post-socialist media ecology, of course, loudspeakers and open air cinema had faded and cooled against the proliferating noises of consumer electronics. But recent years saw a revival of both media forms. Uh, so such as the, the new rural loudspeaker project, um, which was launched in 2018 to broadcast the party policies. But many villagers also complain about the noise pollution. However, since the COVID outbreak, uh, rural loudspeakers were praised for going the last mile in fighting the pandemic as local loudspeaker, uh, local broadcasters, uh, they were issuing these stern warnings um, to tell everyone to stay home in colorful local dialects. Um, and two years ago, even in Boston, we heard uh, lost loudspeaker trucks like this. Despite all the talk about social distancing, the mayor of Boston says some people still aren't listening. So today, the message was delivered loud and clear from a speaker. Paul Burton shows us how that message was taken to the streets. Mayor Walsh has declared a public health emergency in the city of Boston. Stay home as much as you can. Sunday had a different sound in the air other than church bells. Several sound trucks made their way through many different Boston communities, broadcasting a message about the about the coronavirus and so on. Sorry, my, um, but I think in China, the, the government has launched a much hotter, noisier, and also omnipresent propaganda and a campaign against the, um, the COVID with both the newest and oldest techniques. So to give an example of um, not loudspeakers, but just a, like a local village parade. <laughs> So remember to ventilate, wash your hands often for good hygiene. Don't go for mahjong poker. Healthy entertainment is at home. And you also have very high-tech versions where loudspeakers attached to drones. So granny, this is our village drone. If you don't wear a mask, then don't go out. Run along now, go home. So many people, or so many villagers talked to you and it was no use. We had to send a drone to fly you home. Now in her youth, this granny was probably mobilized to make noises to shoo away sparrows. Now the sparrow has returned as a flying drone to shoo her home. And indeed carried by um, drones, robotic dogs, like this one in Shanghai. Uh, 
or carried by people telling him to go home, go home. Okay, so carried by drones, robotic dogs, and humans, mobile loudspeakers are now enforcing immobility on the ground with the militant language of the people's war. And instead of uh, congregating the masses, they're not charged with dispersing them, um, except when getting them in line to take PCR tests. And uh, I just last month in Hebei, I thought a very interesting use of loudspeakers also for surveillance and humiliation an old peasant was caught doing his spring planting during a lockdown and he had to, he got caught and he had to make a public confession on the village loudspeaker. Okay, of course, it's spring planting season, and he was eager to go to the fields and um, um, do his spring planting, but now he got caught by the police and had to make a, a confession over the loudspeaker, um, serving again as surveillance as well as propaganda. And we see here also a point in reversal of people shooing away the sparrows from the fields in 1958 versus peasants themselves are being shooed from the fields. Now, as for <laughs> mobile cinema, um, today, uh, uh, well, in, in the, uh, not, not exactly today, this is field work that was done in the, 20, the mid 2018s and um, rural digital projectionists are the, um, they're, they're showing films uh, in, in villages as well. But uh, during the COVID outbreak, many of them converted their mobile cinema vehicles into multi, mo uh, multimedia hygiene propaganda tr trucks that also distributed face masks and disinfected public spaces. And as some official media put it, mobile projectionists are transforming themselves into mobile loudspeakers. Now, why are these grassroots media practitioners such eager propagandists and mouthpieces? And maybe they are trying to prove their value to the current political economy and secure their livelihoods. And not so different from some of these uh, former commune projectionists who are petitioning their provincial governments for retirement pensions, holding a banner that reads, the pioneers of cinema have no support in their old age. While the government procrastinates, we can only sit still and wait for death. So um, those who formerly served as the party's hoshe, throat and tongue, are now making noises for themselves only to be quickly harmonized. And I want to leave you with this image also as a call to recenter the human in media studies, which has very much turned focus away from texts and authors to technologies, materialities, and infrastructures. Um, and um, Friedrich Hitler even called to exorcise the human spirit from the humanities. But by recentering the human in media studies, I don't mean to just return to the great authors and masterpieces, but also to rediscover human agency and subjectivity, labor and creativity, experiences and memories in their media engagement. So thank you very much. Um, I look forward to your questions and comments. That's great, uh, Dr. Lee. That's, uh, thank you so much for this fascinating and insightful talk. I think your talk has really opened up new venues uh, that will invigorate the studies of Chinese cinema culture. And uh, um, yeah, I was especially struck by how you call our attention to the role of the media in Chinese politics. Uh, because normally we only pay attention to the content of political messages or political campaigns, but we seldom actually um, focus on the media, uh, the role of the media, or, or to, to reinterpret Chinese revolution as a media revolution and to recenter the humans as uh, uh, to recenter the human in the media studies. Uh, so now the floor is open. Uh, I welcome participants to raise your questions in the chat box, 
while we're waiting, I'm going to throw out my own question. Um, so, uh, it's wonderful. You you've talked a lot about um, the hot noises, uh, loud particular sounds, uh, which are generated or produced by Chinese folk uh, instruments, etc., and the clattering and uh, the voices by uh, by the children, by women, etc. But I wonder what is the role of the silence and the silence. How does the how does the silence uh, contribute to political management, governance, etc.? Because the the clip you showed um, from the surf, obviously the protagonist it is mute for the most part of the film, right? The silence, silence. Only toward the end, he is able to speak. So maybe you can elaborate on this point. Well, thank you. That is a really great question. I um, I, I think it's quite interesting actually to go, maybe sometimes I'm, I'm using, even though I'm talking about content beyond the film, sometimes the, the films themselves serve as perfect allegories for the media situation of that time period. And the uh, muteness uh, seems to be a recurring theme in a number of Mao's films. And I think that in, the, in, the, in, the, in this case, it's kind of make, helping the mute speak up, helping the mute, uh, giving the mute a voice. And in some ways, that's um, uh, something that loudspeakers were meant to do. Uh, broadcasting stations were also meant to, to do. So when uh, factory loudspeakers were installed initially, many workers were invited to come to the broadcasting station and articulate their experiences. And uh, so it's interesting that uh, the, the, the idea is that the party state, you know, in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the film surfs, it is the party that comes and then the, the mute learns to speak or he is able to, to, to say something. And of course, the first words he says is long live Chairman Mao. And then the, um, in, the, in the case of other loudspeaker, the actual uses of loudspeakers, I think it's interesting that who gets to speak over the loudspeakers are often labor models who, you know, before they were the, I don't know, the subaltern who did not have a voice, who were never able to articulate themselves. And then uh, they are finally sort of given the mouthpiece or given the loudspeaker, given the voice by the party. And then they are, um, their, their voices are amplified or, but, but that voice, but then, but the, their, that corporeal voice actually becomes an instrument. It's a, uh, it's being ventriloquized. So the, uh, the um, you not you they can't necessarily use their own voices even though it, it carry a lot of local color, so I think that it's it's an odd situation where the 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 literal voice uh, the corporeal voice is being amplified, but whose voice is it? Uh, whether it's really their voices or not, there's actually a lot of silence even in the uh, in the loudness that is being projected and amplified. In, the, in that process. And because silence, I think there is also um, this, this need to participate. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm trying to think of the, uh, actually, I, I, uh, Professor Lu, your, um, uh, your own work on, um, on, on these uh, uh, counter espionage films or films that uh, call for the masses to participate in surveillance was very inspiring to me and to 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 read about how um, uh, it's uh, you were making an interesting distinction actually between part uh, sort of the Maoist to participatory surveillance on the one hand and the Foucauldian surveillance uh, on the other and I think the need to participate that, that everyone contribute their voices to the revolution um, is uh, is what what is actually demanded by the party of the people of each individual people. So to say, stay silent, or is already sort of putting yourself into a precarious and dangerous situation under the new regime when you are you are invited to speak. So I think silence uh, in different contexts and that can have a lot of different kinds of meanings. So um, I don't know. So I just sort Thank of touched so on this from many different uh, angles. But sorry. <laughs> it was, oh, it's uh, amazing. Uh, we've got a question from David Smith. Um, thank you so much. I was wondering if you could please talk about how the CCP's loudspeakers influenced music aesthetics in Maoist and post-Mao China. How much would you say that this aesthetics has evolved from its Mao era incarnation? 
Okay, that's a that's an excellent question. That's a little bit beyond my expertise, but I, one thing I can I, I would very much recommend um, Andrew Jones's um, new book called Circuit Listening, which has a chapter on on quotation songs uh, during the Cultural Revolution. And I think one point that he actually makes with these uh, kind of quotation songs that are uh, broadcast over uh, monotone, uh, uh, mono, um, what, what do you, um, the, sort of the particular technical aspect of these loudspeakers is such that they, uh, you, you, you have to have very loud and simple songs that are uh, that can be easily transmitted over these loudspeakers because otherwise there's a lot of distortion so uh, that 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 has an impact on the composition as well of what kind of sounds are best played over loudspeakers um, but as the loudspeakers got softer and people are listening to music through other means and especially i think through transistor radios and then the sounds uh, the voice of Teresa Deng and uh, also uh, Hong Kong and Taiwanese popular singers are coming into China and then sort of cassette tapes are, are sort of better high quality uh, sounds are introduced through other types of sonic technologies. Um, the musical taste has also changed um, and the way people listen to music um, has very much changed as well. Um, but I, I, I think that's a, that's a fascinating question about how musical aesthetics correlate to the technologies through which we're listening to it. And, and I think that actually certain, certain kinds of um, uh, films such as Jia Zhang Ke's uh, platform, which um, begins in 1979 and ends around 1991, it's almost like an in, in, in cycle, or it's kind of a, a showcase of different musical technologies uh, going from like, or, or sonic technologies from loudspeakers to cassette tapes to radio. Uh, radio is also very, very noisy um, because of the jamming and because people, uh, sometimes you're listening across the borders. Uh, so, uh, and then how that co correlates to the type of popular music is uh, also um, can can also be sort of heard through through that film, but but I think more work really needs to be done in terms of how people were listening to music over time and uh, how compos um, composers are thinking along with the types of technologies that were being used to 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 circulate the music. Thanks. Okay, our next comment question comes from uh, Jing Fei Zhang. Thank you, Dr. Li. This is really fantastic lecture. You discussed the cinema and the propaganda strategies in the Cultural Revolution. I was wondering how did the audience think of this collective film screening? How did they get their pleasure of watching these propaganda films? Thank you. Yeah, thank you for asking this, this question. I mean, one of the reasons why I started um, doing this uh, kind of uh, uh, film reception uh, beyond the film text kind of project had to do with when I was um, when I've been teaching Chinese cinema oftentimes the um, the socialist period the socialist films are the most difficult to teach because they're so obvious and so in some ways so boring to the to current students they're almost unteachable uh, they the main propaganda message is being like reiterated over and over again within them so I was having a hard time reconciling like the film text texts, uh, the formulaic film texts themselves, and the pleasure and the nostalgia with which my parents and their friends who lived through this period speak of movie going. And then when I asked them precisely about their experience of the cinema, of, of cinema, what is it that they actually are nostalgic for? Is it the, the, the stories of the films? Is it the actor? It's a sort of a combination of different things, but the stories that they tend to tell are of, for example, like waking up in the middle of the night in order because the movie movie team has arrived and they you know it's been like month and month since they had seen any film so getting up in the middle of the night to go to a film no matter what it is just to gather together and have some kind of respite from the the tedium of um, of labor in the countryside uh, was a special event. Another kind of story that they would often tell are the highlights in certain films, such as um, there's a Soviet film that was shown over and over again called uh, Lenin in 1918, and it's like it's really really dry as dust. And <laughs> if we watch it today, but there's a ballet sequence, and there's you know um, there's Tchaikovsky's music, and uh, and you can see women uh, dancing, and then they're they're also 
a detachment of women, right? So those are um, those films are being enjoyed for reasons other than the propaganda messages. There's also a kissing scene in um, in uh, Lenin in 1918. So uh, and and they would tell stories about how projectionists, uh, for example, like during those um, um, uh, more erotic the charged uh, scenes, uh, they might actually put their hand in front of the projector uh, in order to um, to censor those moments. And yet, you know, and then the audience would heckle and they would become very upset. And and then uh, the projectionist might let go of the, the, the lens. And so the, 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 the manual censoring of the film along with the audience noise that was being made um, all attributed additional meanings to the film that went beyond what was going on. So I, I, I think that in speaking to audiences about their specific memories of movie going um, and the pleasure that they had taken from these propaganda films, it's, uh, uh, I, I guess uh, this is also why like in the in the book project on cinematic gorillas, I also think of audiences as gorillas because they're um, in, in some ways taking uh, pleasure in films that were not meant, that were not intended at the time. So, um, uh, so a lot of that pleasure is created by the audience themselves. Um, yeah, thank you. Okay, our next question uh, comes from Paulina Hartono. Uh, Jie, this is such a wonderful talk on the subject of loudspeaker from film projections as a spiritual mediumship. I'm curious if there are examples of early PRC era religious or organizations or individuals, however limited as they were, uh, uh, that used these audiovisual media for their own spiritual ends. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Paulina, and thank you for tuning in. Um, yeah, I, I'm trying to think uh, because I, I was looking a little bit into the uh, scholarship on religion under socialism and uh, trying to just find any evidence of. Um, um, how they, uh, I wouldn't say that religious organizations necessarily had access to these technologies, but many of the early film screenings in the, in, at the county level or township level uh, in the 1940s or 1930s actually happened inside churches. Like a guy, I talked to someone in the Catholic church who remembered watching uh, many um, films from uh, about like life and death of Jesus Christ and things like sort of religious films that were shown by a priest that was brought to 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 the countryside. So there was obviously projectors that are, are films that were available in this uh, in the uh, before the um, before 1949. I think after 1949, the official films are often anti-superstition films, but these anti-superstition films sometimes had the opposite effect. So it was quite curious to read about how um, uh, some, uh, there was a, there was a, I don't remember, it was a documentary film or like a, a, a fiction film called uh, Shen Gui Fu Ling or like God and, um, uh, and ghosts are inefficacious. They're not, they, they, they can't help cure your um, uh, diseases. And then there was a, a projectionist actually gave an account of saying that uh, because uh, there's a sequence in the film that shows a shaman or sh shows a spirit medium in the film, and the purpose of the film was to show how they are inefficacious and di uh, didn't manage to cure. But because the performance was so vivid, afterwards the villagers came to the projectionist thinking they're the shamans. Right, and then so so that for them, so audiences might actually understand the films in a very different way from the uh, uh, original intent that had been uh, built into the narratives. Another example I have seen was actually in um, Professor uh, Harrianta Harrison has a, has a book about um, Catholic village, and there was an, an instance of a um, of uh, of a slideshow, like where I think someone wanted to prove to her that there was a, a, the record of a miracle, and took out a bunch of um, lantern slides uh, that included um, that was actually an anti superstition campaign. So th there's a description of that if you want to look it up. So those are the only uh, two small instances that I have found of um, um, maybe sort of um, local religion or uh, local villagers understanding these um, modern technologies in, in their own terms and in, um, in very different ways from um, the, the way that they were being intended. 
Um, but I, I think that just, just the fact that many film screenings were taking place inside uh, formerly religious spaces or spaces of worship um, has an impact on the reception of the audience as well. So thank you. Next question uh, is from Professor Chris Berry at uh, King's um, College London. Thank you so much for the talk. I was very interested in the contemporary COVID use of loudspeakers to enforce rules. We have also heard in the news about communities in Shanghai yelling protests and banning pens. So there seems to be a kind of a counter rule now. Did you also come across any reference to resistance or protest in the Mao era? And did they also take the form of a counter rule now? Hi, um, Professor Berry. Thank you so much for for attending this um, talk. Yeah, I I was I'm I actually haven't finished my research on the COVID uses because there are actually tons and tons of these two way kind of uh, loudspeaker uses and uh, very colorful and very comedic. It's almost like a new genre of comedy now in terms of how loudspeakers are being used by even local cadres. They're of course enforcing rules for the most part, but there's something very comedic and subversive about these very local uses as well. And then from the, yes, I, I've seen the some videos of the Shanghai yelling protest and the, you know, the banging pots. So like almost the old strategies that were used against sparrows are being reused for, for uh, resistance. Um, I think in the Mao era, I haven't really come across, I think the counter really now would be more sort of mocking the messages of the film. So the even the, the quote from Acheng that I was reading um, of uh, sometimes people would be um, uh, actually, to go back to another kind of uh, Lenin 1918 example that you see in um, in the film In the Heat of the Sun is that if people know the lines backwards, if they know uh, all the, um, they know a film, they can call out the lines before um, before the uh, these um, uh, before that part of the film is being played. So they're kind of making a mockery of the film that is being played. Uh, so in, in terms of movie going, I think I've seen this, but in terms of the uses of loudspeakers, because loudspeakers are very locally controlled. Uh, so I think there's a lot of local errors and because local cadres are themselves villagers who are using um, you know, the local languages and saying very interesting things, sometimes they also make mistakes. So what I have come across are often the broadcasting of uh, enemy radio the accidental broadcasting, sort of accidents of uh, broadcasting accidents. I think they're called like Guangbo Shifu or something uh, where um, uh, they would, because radio is part of the broadcasting station that, um, um, and then someone leaves the broadcasting station, forgets to turn off the radio or forgets to turn off the loudspeaker. And then the radio picks up actually like a foreign radio station that is making propaganda against sort of counter CCP propaganda. And then that creates almost like an incidence. But uh, but those are not intended. I think that in the, in the Mao era, it would be uh, very dangerous to intend this kind of uh, counter right now. Um, but um, I, yeah, I, I, those are moments I would definitely be looking for as well. I think it's more of like a whisper, whereas the loudspeakers is very much enforcing the voice of authority. Uh, I'd like to remind participants, uh, we welcome your comments and questions. Please type them in the Q&A box. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I really um, share your sentiment and reflection on the difficulty of teaching Mao era cinema <laughs> because it's like so, so boring, so dull. But uh, as your research has demonstrated, uh, if we do it well, this field is fascinating because your research has demonstrated the potential of using Mao era cinema to challenge the dominant uh, Western uh, theoretical paradigm. Uh, for instance, I've noticed you now pay attention to, uh, you, you also kind of use the phenomenological approach to pay attention to the importance of the human body, the, corp the corporeal dimension of the revolution and the revolutionary media. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, for loudspeakers and open air cinema, 
I think they may not be restricted within Maoist era. If we're looking, mm -hmm. if we look at socialist revolutions uh, over the in the whole all over the world, so is this Re now like a hot noise unique to the Chinese case or not in socialist revolutions? Yeah, thank you so much for, I actually have been thinking a lot about what's really, what we mean when we use words like Maoist versus socialist and what is being, um, uh, because sometimes they use them more somewhat interchangeably and then, but socialists might have a longer time duration from maybe, I, I think you can extend socialists to the 1980s. And then also if socialists connected to collective ownership because Mao era is so much associated with a period that Mao was alive and in power. Um, and, but there's definitely a sense of ending, right? But Maoist also suggests like something unique to China as opposed to um, um, sort of a, a more um, global socialist arena. And uh, so socialist already su suggests a certain kind of comparative framework. So I think that these terms can be used strategically depending on what we are, um, what we're trying to get at. But in terms of what is, I, I think it's always a good question actually to ask what is unique in the Chinese situation because the kind of the Maoist media networks, if, I, if we talk about Maoist, I think, um, um, the, in, in terms of the 1950s, a lot of the radio res, uh, networks and then the also film networks are modeled um, uh, after the Soviet Union. So the Soviet Union really provided the Soviet experts came in and tried to, um, they, they gave a lot of advice. And then so even like film projection magazine at the time uh, was doing a lot of translation of just the Soviet examples. And then sort of also Lenin and Stalin's slogans were everywhere in terms of talking about the significance of radio and cinema, um, what, what radio is for, or, you know, cinema is like film is the greatest of all the arts. But I do think that the corporeal uses, uh, the, the, the way that humans substituted for technological inadequacy um, is quite specific to the Chinese context. Uh, uh, and that's also why I look at some of the earlier writings from uh, Mao and other, um, uh, other sort of communist, Chinese communist leaders, especially the, um, um, from the 1920s and 1930s uh, uh, in terms of what was done under guerrilla warfare against Japan in the, in the face of inadequate technological uh, developments, what kind of um, um, uh, networks can be built with human forces. And I think that's, even in the case of radio, I think it's quite interesting that instead of saying wiring or electrifying the entire country, um, in, instead of creating electrical grids and creating, a, um, you know, having like everyone have a radio set or having loudspeakers everywhere, what was done initially was to actually have people take the radio sets into the villages and to stage these collective events. And these collective events, I think that, you know, to get back to the idea of spirit mediumship or, you know, they kind of take the place of former temple fairs. They take the place of uh, a lot of uh, local um, gathering, local community events, whether they're sacred or, um, or just the secular, um, but I, I think that a lot of the earlier indigenous religiosity is be, being displaced um, by, by the new government. That is not necessarily just about importing something foreign, but rather uh, saying like, you know, even I think a case like the um, a film such as The White Haired Girl, um, the rhetoric of turning ghosts into humans. And then a lot of, there, there are many kind of indigenous uh, religious elements that are present in Maoist media production, as well as in the, its circulation and, um, um, and usage that I think are specifically Chinese to, um, uh, and, and that's even though the technology might be borrowed or some of the larger um, infrastructures are um, created under the, you know, kind of modeled after the Soviet Union, but when the, when the technology is not in place, when there isn't enough, then the, the sort of certain guerrilla tactics are being employed from the period of the Sino-Japanese War. So I think there are many specific uh, Chinese elements to the usage of media in, in this period. So thank, thank you. you so much. Uh, our next question comes from Liu Wenjing uh, from a university in China. Thank you very much for your fascinating talk. 
Do you have any comparison between Chinese experience in the media, media use with other socialist and communist countries' way of using public media? I think you have just uh, partially addressed uh, this question. If you want to add anything more, please do so. Yeah, no, thank you very much, uh, Jean, for, for this really great question. I, I, I think that I really would like to do more comparative work as well. Some, uh, a lot of the work on loudspeaker, not necessarily in communist countries, but I, I just found it fascinating to read a book about um, the, uh, in Germany, the Nazi soundscape book about the uses of uh, uh, loudspeaker vans in 1930s Germany. Um, that uh, there were also quite a lot of interesting parallels between the, uh, the, the um, uh, sort of domination of the soundscape and uses uh, um, in a way to, to conquer a space using sound was, uh, and we, we see this even today, right? A lot of the, uh, the, uh, the uses of loudspeakers today is also to impose a certain kind of uh, sonic um, authority. Um, but I, I'm not sure if it was used in exactly the same way. And I think that every place has a very different way of dealing with soundscapes. So for example, it would actually be really interesting to find out how like church bells or minarets and like other types of uh, public sounds were regulated in different places. And I think I've heard uh, about how church bells were had to like, um, uh, sort of lower or, or change their, their sounds also in, um, in other socialist and communist countries that they couldn't be as loud as before. So, uh, so that's something that really awaits further um, comparison, but thank you for, for this, um, for your suggestion. Oh, I don't see any new questions, but uh, I, I'd like to ask you the last one. <laughs> Thank you. So yeah. this is maybe uh, an advice you can give to students and scholars who research in Chinese media and culture, uh, because your project is a very, uh, you know, it's a very challenging one. And I have seen you use different kinds of methods, materials. So could you say some, say a little bit about your methodologies and how you look for mm -hmm. locate those uh, primary sources? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I feel I don't know. I you know in the research methods have changed so much in the or they are going to change. Or many of us who are located outside of China have not been able to go to archives or do field work. Um, the um, so the um, the book project that I'm finishing up. I have a section on methodology. It's called Cinematic Guerrillas. So I'm calling my methodology also guerrilla methodologies because it's very mobile and it sort of mixes um, a variety of different kinds of methods depending on what kind of materials that I have access to. But I I really would suggest just being very um, resourceful about uh, like locating different kinds of sources from different places because for example sound is such an ephemeral thing it's very difficult to capture there are no archives uh, oftentimes I learned that even if you had the best relationships to radio stations maybe they didn't even have recordings of their radio programs so the absence of archive the absence of these kind of the, the text itself means you know if you are still interested in radio programs it's still possible to find pamphlets of because broadcasters have scripts scripts, right? So sometimes they are model scripts that they have been, or like manuals for broadcasters. So I found things like um, uh, radio reception, like Guangbo uh, Shouying Yuan, or radio receptionist manuals. And they are, those are actually uh, widely printed, widely available. And then you can actually find out a lot about how to run a radio station from these, uh, these kinds of manuals. And then you also have sample programs. And now like in terms of, uh, and then jumping to the COVID era, I think we, we all can't go to China, those of us located outside of it, but it's actually really just amazing how much live streaming or, or just like record, even on YouTube, I was typing in like or and then just the number of uh, uh, amazing kind of little recordings that are made 
of um, uh, local loudspeaker use in various dialects uh, is actually extremely rich. So even though we're not there, there are certain other types of ethnographies that are available and through search engines. So there was, um, I, I showed like a cartoon from 1936 and I, I found that actually because I was really interested in radio listening. So I, I, I in terms of like thinking about keyword searches, like ting zhong, right? Uh, I was uh, I was interested in how you construct the listener, and then so so this cartoon came out, um, and this cartoon is very telling, too. So, um, but in terms of actual like, if, if there's a way to actually go into China and do field work, uh, then um, there I think relying on local relationships and talking to people who have access uh, sort of to, I don't know, I think that there's a way of doing like almost like using sociological methods as well and bringing in, uh, bringing clips, bringing posters of films that you're interested in and asking people and doing interviews that way. Um, I don't know how possible it is to do sort of digital interviews nowadays via WeChat, but I always try to questionnaires, right? Like, and then I got a few people who you know, who really were very generous with sharing their memories and they were writing down these uh, wonderful, you know, like um, uh, memories of just their movie going experiences and uh, uh, with the, how they related to particular films. Um, they're also, because we're in the digital era where it is possible to search like full text searches and then there are certain kinds of topics that um, you know, if you know what you're looking for, then you can actually collect a lot of interesting um, uh, movie going ex experiences. Um, yeah, and I, I actually tried the same thing with uh, with cassettes. I was also interested in like cassette players, but those are much harder. Somehow like there's less written. So it also depends on, you know, I think for, for some time when old movie theaters were be being demolished, there's almost a documentary impulse to preserve uh, memories. And then there was a lot of writing actually just about their memories of particular movie theaters or particular experience, childhood experiences. And those are also really wonderful sources. I think sometimes fiction can serve as sources if they are qualified and, and somehow um, uh, um, analytically sort of treated. So those are some of my suggestions. Thank you so much for generously share your, uh, sharing your tips and uh, advice. Um, I think if our participants today are present, uh, you will hear a loud round of applause. <laughs> I'm afraid I have to wrap up here and thank you all. Thank you to our audience today. And thank you, Professor Li Jie. Thank you so much for having me and thank you everyone for tuning in. Bye. Bye. <laughs>